the tag you ask? I'm Evangeline. And I'm Ziha. And we'll be serving you today's tag. Welcome to the Unconventional Hustles podcast of the What's the Tag series, brought to you by North, the North American chapter of the 10th International Council of Malaysian Scholars and Associates. We aim to uh, destigmatize various industries that are yet to be explored in Malaysia. On today's episode, we'll be diving into the realm of sports with a very special guest from the world of figure skating. Please introduce yourself. Hey everybody, it's me, Julian Yi, um, Malaysia's national figure skater. Awesome! Thank you, awesome. Much, uh, so, thank you for like being here today. Yeah, yeah so, no, my, my pleasure. Thanks guys for having me on. So what have you been up to these days? Yeah. <laughs> what have I been up to? Uh, well, the, the good thing like right now, as, as we are doing this podcast, uh, things are slowly starting to open back and uh, getting back to... I wouldn't say the usual, but, you know, better off than when we first started our lockdown and all that. So uh, getting a little bit more busy again, um, trying to plan things out now, a lot of scheduling going on. Um, but for the most part, before all of this, as, as um, all of us went into lockdown, I think that was that was an amazing time for me to just relax. <laughs> and just laze around a little bit more. Yeah, it's not very often I get to just do nothing. Um, but yeah, that was great. It was a good time. <laughs> That's that is so true. I know, right? It's like finally we have you know um, some time to ourselves because always like when 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 things were back as normal, it's like you got to do this, this, that, this, that. And now finally, it's like okay, there's only so much things you can do, so there's no excuse for yourself to say okay, let's take a break, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And talking about breaks, um, I guess in your skating career now, are you taking a break? Or are you still kind of pursuing it? So right now, I'm I'm definitely slowing down. That's for sure. Um, mainly because there's there's so much more uh, that I have to plan ahead for me in, in life. Uh, I mean, skating is great, competing is great, but you can only compete for so many years. And um, I to me, it's like you know, I got to think of my future. How am I gonna uh, make a living? Because uh, competing, unless you are a world champion or top five in the world, it's very hard to make a living from just competing. <laughs> the those at the bottom end of the the competitions don't really get money from winning because <laughs> we don't win. Uh, but yeah, for me, I mean, I'm I'm solely just trying to to balance out life um, in terms of um, my studies and work and all that. So just trying to incorporate everything. So that's why I'm taking a little bit slow with skating right now. I see. So, can you tell us a little bit more about some of your future plans? So, like, where are you planning to go to after, you know, you sort of, like, <laughs> um, So, I, I've got, I've sort of got, like, two, two paths that I, I could potentially go on to. Um, the first being um, coach, a figure skating coach, um, which is why I started my, my skating academy back home. Um, that would be ideal considering the fact that I've already learned so much from the sport. It will be a great way to, to give back and also, you know, at the same time, um, make it useful to myself. Um, but all, also it depends on many factors. Um, knowing that mm. skating is not as famous and, and well-known in Malaysia, um, it yeah. could be a very tricky market as well, um, which, is why I'm, which is why I'm still studying, <laughs> you know, uh, finishing up my degree. I'm a little bit late with that, not going to lie, uh, mainly because of skating as well. So there's a lot of sacrifices in there. And uh, I figured, you know what, it's better late than never. It's always good to have a backup plan, that kind of thing. So that's why I still have my degree to, to fall into, if anything, to say it will go not the way I want it to go. Um, but yeah, there's so... no such thing as like being late. Like oh, everyone has their own <laughs> timing. So really... Yeah, exactly. You know... I mean, okay, like, if you think of it this way... Um, a lot of my friends already graduated and all that. So I'm like, okay, guys, you know what? When you guys become doctors, then I graduate with you, but with a different degree. <laughs> uh, but it's fine. Like to me, you know what? Everybody, like you said, everybody has their own path, different different pace of timing. Um, yeah. And to me, most importantly, as long as I get it done, then that's, that's good for me. Yeah. Yeah. I guess to better understand your future path, let's go back to like where you first started. What kind uh -huh. of like motivated you or like led you to figure skating 
<laughs> oh, if we dig way back, way back when I first started, um, honestly, I I didn't know I was skating. Uh, I was four years old when I started skating, so um, I had no clue. I yeah, I had no clue what it was. Uh, I knew like, my mom just brought me to the ring um, along with my brothers, and it was just an activity kind of thing. Um, but as the years went by, I I slowly sort of had an idea of what this was. Um, and then at the age of five, believe it or not, it's my first competition at the age of five, but obviously wow. five years yeah. old. It's, yeah, well, it's not like I'm jumping around. No, no, it's like a very simple competition where you just skate around, you know, uh, show off maybe one one spin and that's it. <laughs> uh, but that, that was like a start into all the competitions that, that started going. Um, and, and that sort of like um, just snowballed into something bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so for me, I think when I totally realized or completely sort of knew what I was doing was probably, I think I was in um, elementary school, primary school. Um, that's when more competitions, it was still not, um, how to say, uh, international competitions. Because when I started skating, uh, Malaysia at the time only had recreational competitions, which means that it's the competition, it's basically, it's just for recreation. It's not competitive. So you, with those competitions, you can't go to like World Championships, Olympics and all that. It was just within the region. Um, so I started with that and I really took it very seriously in that time. So even though it was recreational, a lot of, lot of training, a lot of skating. Um, my day was full, school, tuition, skating, <laughs> skating, wow. tuition, oh gosh, school. PTSD. Yeah, nonstop. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's how that's how it was. <laughs> and the tuition, oh my god, tuition at that time was horrible. It was it was like I you know. Do not understand why parents put primary school kids through tuition. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if it's still a trend, but back then, like, every kid had tuition. So and for me, like right after school, immediately after school, I finished school at like one. You go to tuition all the way until like five, six o'clock. Yeah, it was like I used to call it a torture center, not really tuition. Uh, <laughs> but that's I think that's how how like most of us grew up with like that. Uh, and then yeah, I was skating after, and in the morning was skating again, and then went to school and all that. So it was it was kind of thing. And yeah, that's when I realized okay, this this was a a big thing, and you know I I quite liked it at the start. So yeah, I kept on going with it. When when you were beginning to learn, you know how to skate when you were like four years old. Did you ever feel uh -huh. scared, like taking your first step into the ice skating ring? No, yeah. I was fearless. I just you went like, on. <laughs> again, wow. again, stupid me didn't probably know what I was doing, so I just ran <laughs> like in, fall down, stand up. I mean, I had to wear a helmet when I started. Uh, a lot of people made fun of me because my helmet was a bicycle helmet with oh uh, yellow yellow ducks on it. So oh it was a blue helmet God. with yellow oh ducks. Exactly. So that's what everybody was like, oh my god, this boy. And then they started like, you know, just like drumming on my head uh, with the helmet. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I mean, to me, I was, yeah, I just ran, um, cause havoc, and then just fall down, stand up, run, laugh, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, no fear. Four years wow, old, no fear. That's amazing, man. Like, that's something that a lot of people can learn from. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, yeah. but at the time, like I said, like don't know much. So, <laughs> did your, did, I think your mom, I believe, is part of the mm -hmm. skating uh, committee in Malaysia. Was yeah, she one of she the is. biggest factors that like kind of pushed you into skating, and was she supportive of like your? Yeah, journey, I mean, I definitely. She she was the reason why my brothers and I started skating. Um, funny story. She wanted to skate herself. Uh, she wanted to learn, so she brought us. She ended up learning for like I don't know, a very short while, and then she gave up. <laughs> um, and we continued. Um, and throughout the years, she we 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 basically grew with the sport in Malaysia. Uh, we started off with pretty much not not much foundation in Malaysia, and uh, we grew to where we are now, which is still not fully established, but um, we've come a long way from when we started as a sport you know? and um, she she was learning as we went as well and um, yeah she, she got involved with a lot of um, planning and all that with, with skating in Malaysia and tried to you know help develop skating as well so she, she also has a passion for skating yeah in, yeah. in a different way not, not the skating skating way but in a different factor <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I guess like um a lot so a lot of the people who are or who would like to pursue sports don't have that um their you know uh, parental support and stuff like that. What would yeah. one piece? What is one piece of advice I guess you would give to those people? To the parents? <laughs> um, I guess to the kids more because you know. Or to the kids, I guess here's the thing, um, in it's very funny because in Asian culture, a lot of things we do is, especially, I don't know about the generation now. I, I, honestly, the generation now is a bit different. I, <laughs> I'm trying to wrap my head around that. I, I don't know if you can relate. Uh, <laughs> but most of the time, a lot, of, a lot of things we do is because of our parents. They, they either they tell us to do it or they guide us to do it or they give us hints to do it, you know? Um, and it turns out actually that sometimes it's for the best for us. Um, not everything, but most of the time, whatever your parents say, it's normally it's for your best interest. And, and it turns out that you can either use it in the future somehow uh, for whatever you learn. And, and I find like if your parents are not supportive, but you really love it, there's always a way that you can try to convince them um, to, to let you pursue it, um, especially with, with something this unique in skating. Um, you got to think of it this way. Not many people will be able to do it. And if you already have the slightest chance, just try your luck and, and keep pushing to see how far you can go. Um, because yeah, it's it's a very niche sport, so I think it will the the benefits in the future will, will be a lot more. Yeah, yeah, that's great advice. So mm -hmm. on to you know sort of like how your skating career kind of grew and how you're joining more and more international competitions. Uh, yeah. what, what would you say is your most significant advantage against your competitors? What stands out? <laughs> wow. Uh, what's that advantage? Oh, there's not many of them. Uh, oh, <laughs> a lot of disadvantages. <laughs> you're representing Malaysia. <laughs> uh, uh, I, think, I think one sort of one way of thinking going into it is because coming from Malaysia, we're not developed in skating at that time. Um, my my mindset was going in, okay, whatever it is, it is like, like the results. Just the expectation is not to win. Going in with something realistic. Um, I, I always went into competitions with a realistic mindset that, you know what, I'm not going to be world champion, let's face it. Um, I'm not going to, you know, get so and so much points because I know where I stand. So having that realistic kind of point of view yeah. helps me sort of stay focused into what I want to achieve. You know, some people will say, okay, dream big. That's great. You can dream big. But is it possible or not? A different yeah. story, right? right. Um, so if you, if you think of it this way, if you set your mind to something that you can achieve, right, and you actually achieve it, you feel much better because, yeah. you know, you reach your goal rather yeah. than, you know, well, I'm going to do this and then you're so far off and it just demotivates you. So exactly. when, when, whenever I used to compete, you know, um, I would always look at the, who my competitors are and even though we all compete in the same event, we're all competitors, I will select a few that I know are almost same level as me. And then I will have my own category in that, that, you know what, if I can beat, let's say, five people from that, that selected names, uh, I'm happy, that kind of thing. And then it slowly inched more and more and more. So it started off, my first goal was to not come in last. I didn't come in last, I came in second last. So... <laughs> I still reach my goal. I still reach my goal, right? Um, yeah. And you know what? That gave me a bit more motivation. You know, okay, let's slowly go a little bit more, a little bit more. So I think in that sense that if you have a mindset, it's a good advantage to you because you can't control what your competitors think. You can control what you think. Um, so you've got to use what you have to your to your advantage. I think that's yeah. a, a really... Oh yeah, I can't imagine um having that mindset. <laughs> That's really like, amazing. I can't imagine. Yeah, it, it's pretty hard to you know, <laughs> stay motivated towards like a certain goal. And I'm, I yeah. think you did it pretty well, honestly. Okay, <laughs> I try. I try my best. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, like you were the first Malaysian to go into the Olympics for figure skating, and I don't know. <laughs> I think that, that is like an amazing feat on its own because, like you said, like in Malaysia, you know, like. Winter sports, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, going into the whole like Olymp Olympics thing and the competing yeah. atmosphere, how was it? How was that atmosphere? Wow. Uh, it was 
it was very unique. Um, I, I, I honestly believe that my first time ever going to Olympics will be a one of a kind experience. Even if I manage to qualify again, I don't think it will be that uh, memory because simply because it was the first time Malaysia got to the Winter Olympics, right? Um, it was it was a huge moment for Malaysia. It was also huge for the international stage because the first time a new country. I think there was only like four is it four or five other countries that made it the mm-hmm. first time as well to the Winter Olympics. So it was a good addition to it. Um, and I was very fortunate to have a lot of opportunities during the Olympics. Um, I was very fortunate to be the flag bearer for Malaysia during the opening mm-hmm. ceremony um, because I did a um, an, a program that, that the Korea government did in bits for the Olympics uh, a few years ago. They, I think it's been running for at least 10 years. What they mm-hmm. do is they get um, uh, athletes from non-winter countries to, to go to Korea and experience winter, uh, try all the different winter sports, um, as a program to promote Korea to get the Olympic spot, right? To get to to bid for the Olympic location, um, and I was, I think, the only athlete from that entire program, that I think ten over year program to make it to the Korea Winter Olympics. I see. So be- because of that, they they were. They were very happy that the one there was one athlete who made it, <laughs> and um, they yeah. So out of the so many years, there was one athlete who made it to that exact Korean Olympics. There, uh, they they asked me to be a torch bearer, so I was lucky enough to to carry the the Olympic flame, and, and pass it on. So I think a lot of a lot of opportunities arise, and uh, I was just very lucky to to be able to experience that. So it was it was a great amazing feeling. Um, it's yeah, amazing, sure. that, you know, like even though you, you're given so much um, huge opportunities, you know, you still, you're still very humble about it and you don't sort of like, <laughs> I, 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 like I try, I try. I mean, that's, that's, I, I try my best. <laughs> that's a really good mindset and attitude. Yeah. So moving on, so um, on to, you know, some of your competition pieces, what would you say was your favorite piece that you ever performed? Oh, ah, <laughs> uh, wow! That was that's a tough one. Um, there were some programs which I did not like, <laughs> um, but then there were some that, that I really enjoyed. Um, I think one of the most fun one that I did uh, for competition was probably to um, a mix of three different songs from James Brown. It was mm-hmm. fun. It was funky. Um, I was able to connect with the audience and just get everybody going. Um, and that's what I like about skating. Like you're able to perform, and half the time, I think most athletes in skating think of performing for the judges, right? Because they are the one that gives you the points. But right. then, some of us tend to forget that you know at competitions we also have audiences that watch, right? Sometimes you have stadium mm-hmm. full up to about twenty, thirty thousand people. So um, it's very important that you engage with the audience as well. And I felt that program was able to. Um, get, you know, connect with the audience a little bit more, uh, get them off their seats, maybe dancing along a little bit. Um, and I think that that that's probably the most satisfying, knowing that you can um, you can bring some happiness and joy to people when they watch you skate. So for me, I think that was one of the best. And, and again, if the audience is behind you, it will, it's a definitely a, a, a huge um, advantage because mm. people always succumb to peer pressure. <laughs> even though they're not supposed to they're very professional i'm not saying they do but it's just a human factor well, that's the <laughs> it, happens. <laughs> it happens right have you ever personally you know like got, gotten involved in like the arrangement of the the performance song uh yeah 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 so most of my 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 programs um up until at least until i knew what i was doing i would say since I was in probably high school, 13, yeah, about 13 years old, I already, I already had my own sort of ideas of what songs I wanted to use. Um, I ran through it with my coach, with my choreographer. We, we discussed about it and then we said, okay, you know what? Let's try this out. Let's do this. Uh, before that, again, I had no idea. Coach say do this, me to do this. <laughs> uh, yeah. But now, yeah, I have a say. Um, normally what I do is I find a few different pieces, different choices. I let them listen to it. And then we say, okay, this one might work. This one might not. And then we piece them together. 
Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, you mentioned a little bit about like the programs that you did not like. Uh-huh. <laughs> Would you consider them like your lower points in your skating career or like what exactly are your lower points? The lowest point? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, like, I think the lowest point in, 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 in my entire career so far is probably when, when I felt like I, I wanted to quit skating. Um, that was sometime, I think, 11, 12 years old. Um, mm-hmm. We were, I was like, yeah, it's too much, a lot of sacrifice, you know, don't have a life, that kind of thing. Friends go for, for a birthday party, you are skating. Uh, friends go movie, you are skating. Uh, <laughs> you know, wow. friends go for, uh, I don't know, school trip, you are skating. <laughs> so at that point, I was like, like, you know what, is there anything else that I can do um, so I, I really thought like, you know, I, whatever, I just want to give up. That's it. You know, at the time I haven't competed internationally yet, competitive. Mm. So that was towards the end of my recreational competitions kind of, um, time. Uh, my brother and I both wanted to quit lah, cause he associated <laughs> and, and we were like, you know what, dude, let's, let's just, let's just call it done. Uh, and then, um, my, so what, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What kept me going? <laughs> so. We, we tried, we, we spoke up to our mom <laughs> about, you know, like we, we have not much interest in it anymore. Uh, and then she, she has magic powers. So we kept on going. <laughs> 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 it's very convincing in a way. Um, some psychology used, uh, but no regrets to that. I mean, it, it was, I was glad that she, she, made us keep going at it because not long after I, I started my first international competition. Um, and that's when I realized like, you know what, there's so much more to what I know about skating because when I first went out to compete internationally, I, I was, I was competing even in junior, but with, with the big guns, you know, from mm. U S Russia, Japan, China. And, and here I am from Malaysia, uh, some Kampong, Kampong champion, but go out and lose. So seeing that, you know, they are so much better and what they can do is, is a huge difference from what I can already do. That made me sort of want to push myself and say, you know what, I want to be able to um, give them a fight, not even beat them, to be on the same level as them to, to mm-hmm. give a, a fair fight for a competition. Mm-hmm. And that, that was like, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm going to see if I can push myself. And that made me sort of want to continue skating. And, and yeah, and from then on, and it just I grew the more competitions I went. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, and, go ahead. And I imagine that kind of uh, brought you to uh, Canada for training and stuff like that. Uh, it eventually did, but I only, Canada was, was a much later period in my career that mm. I, I came to. Um, so far, I, I've been training in Malaysia up to, I think, what, 2016, 15, 16. Oh, and I see. Um, about uh, two years before the Olympics, I I moved to Canada for training. Um, but y- yeah, like to me, every competition I went was something for me to learn, to learn from my competitors. Uh, every time I competed, I would watch, I would stay on and watch the rest of the people and see, you know, what can I gain from this experience? Mm. And uh, that that kept me going all the time. And then eventually, you know, the 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 thought of Olympics. Um, came closer to reality about later on, right? 2015. Mm-hmm. And that's when, when we decided, you know what, if I want to be able to give it a shot, I, I would have to, you know, find expertise from elsewhere um, to, to push me further. And that's when Canada came into, into place. Right. I see. Yeah. So when you came over to Canada in 2016, uh, you weren't in university, right? So you came over solely for your training. I, I was in university. Uh, so yeah. I graduated uh, high school. I think twelve fourteen. <laughs> yeah, twelve fourteen. I think. Uh, yeah, I think you're uni- old, a year older than me. So two thousand fourteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fourteen, fourteen. I finished high school three KL, uh, and then fifteen. I started uni, uh, and train at the same time back home. I started in Sunway. Uh, and then after that, uh, I did about a year and a half or so. 
So in between uni, during exam break, I, I came to Canada for that short amount of period to try it out. Um, and at that moment, I knew, okay, this, this would be the place for me to train. So then mm-hmm. the year after, I took a gap year. Well, gap years, <laughs> year and a half, I would say. <laughs> gap year and a half. Uh, came for training full-time and then um, worked towards the Olympics. And af- right after the Olympics, I transferred to a uh, university here in Canada. I see. So, like, you're currently majoring in business admin, right? Yeah. Business, did you, business, yeah, business. Did you ever know that you wanted to go into business, like, even in your uh, ADTP period? Or <laughs> yeah, were you exploring yeah, yeah, yeah. that time? Uh, I was exploring. So, in a, so, here's the thing. Me and studies, right? We don't exactly <laughs> see eye to eye too much. <laughs> okay, I mean, I don't fail my subjects. I'm just not a style, a straight A student. Um, in life, again, you have to give and take. If you you want to do this, you can't have that, you know? Uh, so for me, as long as I maintain decent grades, right, um, I was fine. So back in high school, I was very bad in in math. I hated math. I'm a disgrace to Asians. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but I, I still pulled through, right? Um, so I, I don't know. To me, because of my brother and all that, so he did science stream, so I also did science stream. So I had all sciences, uh, econs, uh, business, accounts. Um, so, and I excelled the best in my business business course. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like, okay, you know what? I quite like business. You know, business is quite versatile. You can do much with it. Um, and you know what? My grades are also not bad with business. So uh, that was one of the deciding factors. You know what? Okay, in uni, I think I'm going to go in the business route. Uh, I quite mm-hmm. like it. I like, I like management. So, um, yeah, I, I started to do my, just my basic first year courses for, for business and all that. And then, uh, came to Canada and, and found, you know what, there, there's, uh, so my, my, my exact major is HR as well. So HR management and I, I, I quite enjoy managing. So like, mm-hmm. that's, that's how I went to, to management. I, I needed to find something that was versatile and, and able yeah. to, you know, mix around because. I don't know exactly like, you know, what I want to be in the future, whether I want to be a doctor or a lawyer, that's not really me. So I figured that this could probably mix with a lot of different um, industries and fields. I definitely agree. I mean, that's the reason why we're having this podcast in the first place, kind of to, you know, um, steer (laughs) away from the typical Asian stereotype of like, oh, you know, the top three lawyer, doctor, exactly, yeah, yeah. And there's nothing bad about that. Let's put it this way. There's nothing bad about being a doctor lawyer. That's great. Amazing. You know, I would love to have so but, many doctor and lawyer friends. Yeah, so I can but find not them. everyone but, can be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's not, yeah. It's not everybody's cup of tea. That's true. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So, so I, I think what's important is because a lot of times people do their degrees and end up not doing what they did. Yeah. Right. Uh, which is fine, right? <laughs> which is nothing wrong with it. Uh, it's just that you, you always want to keep an open mindset, right? Um, it doesn't mean if you do this, you have to do that. So like for me, if you're unsure, if you don't know what you want to do, find something that is g- more generic. They always say, oh, this is not too generic, not good for you. It's like, who cares if it's good for you or not? At the end of the day, um, how I look at it is I get the piece of paper and that's what people want to see it when you apply for jobs. That's all. <laughs> Yeah. You have a piece of paper. Yeah. That's a start already. Because yeah. two years down the road after, yeah, you basically you need it only for your first job. That's true. And then after that, because the next really- job, yeah, they're going to ask for experience, not what, yeah. what, what university what you, doing, you graduate yeah. from. Uh-huh. Exactly. Unless it's obviously certain fields that require that. But majority, if you're, you're going for, let's say, business or, you know, something a little bit more simple, then you only need it for the first job, basically. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and so I feel like, like you know, all the students are kind of like exploratory phase. So for us to yeah. kind of make a decision to know what we really want to do for like the next 40 years. Yeah. Year. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. So yeah, kind of like a really hard thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and a lot, I think the, the new sort of trend right now is a lot of people leave their jobs and start their own businesses. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so in the end, you're your own boss. <laughs> yeah, and, I and mean like... Part, 
<laughs> Even as fresh grads, they expect you to have some work experience. Like, okay, what have yeah. you been doing during your summers? Yeah. What internships have you been doing? And they don't, they, exactly. they don't really look look for the typical GPA anymore. And I think that's yeah. really yeah. awesome in a way. Um, it's that, it's that good for people like me la, with GPA not four point <laughs> I mean, really, the 4.0 doesn't really determine your, you know, you can get a 4.0 no. but have like totally yeah. no soft skills and that doesn't exactly. really work either. Exactly. So, so that, that, like you said, they, they want to look at experience. So obviously your degree does help. Let's let's not discard sure. that. Okay, you work, yeah. you work hard yeah. for it. You know, you get into a good university for it. I'm not saying it's all crap. You, it works. But uh, what's important is that, you know, just don't kill yourself too much on, on focusing on I'm getting that you gotta get your experience and you know mix around with people as well. I definitely agree. Yeah. yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about how did you balance uh kind of joining competitions, going abroad, and also studying at university at the same time? Did, did you mention? Yeah, your- you know, you know that, that <laughs> triangle that uh, a lot of people say we have to pick like social life. In yeah. actual fact, it's more of like a hexagon or like I don't know. It is. It's more. It's more than that. It's like a pentagon or octagon kind of. yeah. it's more than three three fact three three points there, uh, I think for me it was easier because I started young um, high school was the time where I, I learned to balance out a lot of things because uh, I'm I don't know like for me I'm very greedy <laughs> I, I was I, hold, I held a lot of positions in high school as well so aside from competing um I was also like head of whatever committee, this committee. Uh, I was head prefect, uh, house captain, all that nonsense. Uh. Uh-huh. So with all of that, it sort of made me have to like manage my time accordingly and think ahead of time. So like, I, and I, I bring that same principles to to work and uni as well. What is the priority uh, that needs to be done first? So usually when I have like a whole ton of things, I don't know if you guys feel that sometimes there's so many things you have to do, you don't know where to start and you just lost. Yeah. Um, that yeah. happens quite often. So what I do is I just list everything out. And then from there, I, I look at deadlines. Which one needs to be first? And then I start from there. Mm. You get what I mean? So just, yeah. just listing it out to see visually, okay, what needs to be done first, that helps a lot. And, and thinking ahead, let's say for my assignments and all that, let's say if, if I have to hand in an assignment, but I am not available because I've, I'm in a different country competing. So I know that I need the time for my mind to be prepared, mentally prepared for the competition, mm-hmm. let's say a week earlier. And so happened that exact day of competition is the day of my assignment due. So I get my assignment done ahead of time, submit it already, and then that's out of the way. Now I don't have to think about that. I, I focus on my competition. Uh, so I think it's just about a lot more of, of for- forecasting and seeing what you have to do in the future. That I think will help athletes a lot are with, honestly with like one of the most disciplined people on earth. <laughs> like seriously, even like your diet, you know, your, oh, I can't. Yeah, yes and no. Lah. I mean, we just have our, our tricks and, and ways to do it. Lah. I mean, you're, you're living like... Discipline, yeah. Discipline is one thing, but you know, once you're in a trade, you sort of know the shortcuts. So... <laughs> We can rely on that a little bit as well. We are humans after all, so <laughs> we do get lazy. I'll so, tell so you that. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I know in the beginning you were talking about you know how you wanted to uh, pursue maybe some business kind of related stuff uh, in your yeah. future. Uh, yeah. You know, beyond that, let's say like, you know, from 10 years from now, uh, do you see yourself expanding your coaching academy uh, to its fullest, like 100% focusing on your coaching academy, or do you have any sort of personal dreams where you kind of want to try it out and maybe it's something you would try? Yeah, like non-skating related. Non-skating related. So, <laughs> so I would love to uh, to have my academy full-fledged, uh, everything going into it in 10 years' time. But again, it really depends on opportunity. So i got to just try my luck and see. Uh which is why, like I said, there's a backup plan. Um, uh, but if you're looking at something non-related skating, what I always wanted to do uh, was to be a pilot. Oh. 
Oh. I wanted to be a pilot. Uh, I don't know why. I just thought it was cool, like flying planes and all that. Uh, my dad's like, no, cannot, not good. Uh, you know, it's time for family in the end. So <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't go for any pilot course. Plus, it also pilot, the thing about being a pilot, you, you have to, like, again, you have to choose to be a pilot. You can't like take breaks in between and, and you know, go and compete. So obviously, it didn't work out. Um, but that would be something that I would love to in the future, just to fly a plane, whether or not it's commercial or private. Right. Uh, one thing but I in see. terms of having a job become a pilot I don't think so lah. Um, but yeah I think I think for me it's quite sad right now that um, I want to pursue the skating kind of um, pathway uh, but at the same time still open to other different um, paths mm. relating to whatever HR business I mean as we discussed yeah. you know, it's never too late to start something you know maybe yeah like, I mean you can work. always and always be exactly. a pilot. Yeah. Yeah, you can always be a pilot. And, and the thing is, being a commercial pilot obviously has its age. But if you just want to fly a plane myself, it's good. You have, you have the money, you have the time, go and learn. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. One talking thing of the pilot, that kind of thing. Talking a little bit about your, your skating academy, right? Have you ever faced any yeah. kind of um, backlash or like, were there any hurdles you have to go through? trying to expand it. So how was your experience I, like you know, going through uh, starting out as a coach? For your I think I think right now my academy is, is still fairly new. It's, it's So we're still in the growing stage going through a lot of like um, roadblocks and all that. So as we talk, mm -hmm. I'm in that stage right now going through all these stuff where we're trying to break into different markets, uh, get people to trust, trust you. Uh, the mindset that we have as Asians, unfortunately, not everybody, but a good portion, is that if you're not quite low, you're not good. <laughs> mm. Foreign work is always better, right? So trying to mm. break that mindset that, you know, we don't really, it's always good to have expertise from outside, but you also, sometimes you have to trust local brands, right? You know, it's like when we talk about mm. our, our local cast, Proton. What the heck? What the, uh, but then you slowly start to see that they're building themselves. It's getting better now. Uh, yeah, they are. Exactly. So you got to give them, you know, you got to give local people a chance to show what they can do. And then who knows, right? So for me, it's just trying to, to break the mindset that, you know what, um, getting someone local is, is maybe not a bad idea. And then uh, apart from, say, like, instead of Malaysia, I'm also looking at other countries. Um, some countries are more reluctant to, to accepting it. So that's that's a hurdle that I have to go through mm -hmm. as well. And and for me, coaching, I started coaching since I was, I think, 16 years old, oh, wow. part-time. Mm -hmm. So I've I've got a lot of, in terms of, a lot of insight as to how how to interact with, with, um, with skaters. And being a skater myself, um, you know, a lot of coaches were also skaters, but they were skaters maybe 20 years ago. So having still that fresh mm. sort of mindset, it's kind of helps me relate to the skater of how they think, you know, what they're going through. Because a lot of them go through the same thing. They're in school, um, they have whatever, part-time job and all that, you know, just trying to relate back to them would help a lot. And and I find like, especially here in Canada, um, because to be a coach in Canada, you have to be certified and all that. So we have to go through our different levels and all that. I see. Um, so going through that has helped me a lot as well in gaining experience of how to approach situations um, how to talk to people, how to deal with parents. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I find like it's so far as a coach, it's been quite a, a good journey. But the academy itself, it's it's where, you know, it's slowly got to step-by-step step build it up. That's amazing. Okay. You, you share the same mindset, you know, when you're like doing a competition. So you go one step at a time, right? Yeah, and yeah. That, I'm a firm believer of that. It's, yeah. Small steps, you know, sedikit dikit menjadi bukit. Yeah. Yeah, and like they said, like baby steps is still, you know, yeah. steps. Yeah, it's still forward. forward so... Exactly. Even if it's like two steps forward, one step back, it's you, you're inching forward slowly, and sometimes you can't expect instant results. Awesome. I guess to kind of wrap this whole thing up, uh, what is what what is one advice you would give to people who would like to pursue, I guess, figure skating or sports in general? Or also maybe like you, um, a, a business in sports in the future. How I see it is, if we're just looking at sports itself, 
it doesn't matter what sport it is. It can be a, a sport that I've never even heard of before. Uh, first is you have to enjoy it. If you personally like to do it, then go for it. If someone is telling you to do it, think twice. It might or might not be good. Maybe you'll like it after, like how I started. I had no idea what I was doing. Try it out first. Uh, but if you really want to pursue it as a full-time career, as a, as an athlete, uh, you really have to like the sport. You have to enjoy what you're doing. You want to be able to wake up every day and say, okay, you know what? Let's try this out. Let's try this out. Let's try this out. Instead of, oh my God, this again, this again. There will be days that are like that, uh, but that's a very small portion of it. And if you're looking at in terms of how you can incorporate that into your, your life and your future and your work, um, one reason why I chose business is because, like I said, business can be incorporated with many different things. So if I want to do it with sports, business and sports, you come up with a model academy, you can come up with uh, maybe a, tr a training center for trainers, uh, a lot of different things you can explore. Um, and, and like I said, if that doesn't work out, the, the sports doesn't work out for you, you have a degree that you can fall on and apply for a job. <laughs> so don't neglect studies, let's put it this way. As much as it takes like four years yeah. to finish, it will be worth it in the end, uh, whether or not you use it. Because number one, you, you gain experience from, from uni as well, just making friends, connections. Mm. And yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I believe that education is still very important. Get it done if you can. And, and then you can explore your opportunities after. Wow. Okay, thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, you. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, All right. so uh, for now, we will, we will conclude our Q&A session and we'll be going to a sort of more casual ICMS tea time. <laughs> So, <laughs> in this section of ICRC time, we'll be uh, starting out with what's the tape. Uh, the rules are pretty simple, so we'll, we'll describe sort of how a tea uh, looks like, how it feels like, maybe how it tastes, and then so you guys, <laughs> from, from that kind of uh, presentations that you would hear from our description, you would try to guess what kind of tea it is. So, All right. yeah, and don't worry, we picked the like super mm. basic one. And I only know a handful of teas, okay? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and we only have a handful, okay. so it's totally let's, in my let's, mind. Let's see. Let's see uh, if we can match it up. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're going to get most of them, right? Okay. okay. I know if there's one with color, I know already. <laughs> Sorry? If there's one with a color, I know I know what tea it is, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll start off with something easy. Okay, really, really easy. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is kind of a, a powdered tea, traditionally consumed in East Asia, and it's green in color. Green tea! There we go! No, it's not! It's green it's color! The, 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 the other name. Okay, there's matcha. green tea, and then there's yeah, matcha. That. Oh right. my god, so specific. Oh boy. <laughs> oh wow. Right. <laughs> oh my, okay, okay. Wow, I didn't know it was so technical. Okay, I got use my brain a bit. Okay, come on. Next one, let's go. <laughs> okay. The next one um, is a tea that is super prominent in subtle Asian mm. traits. I don't know if you're in subtle Asian traits, mm. but um, there is suddenly a spike in its hype in um, Asia and also like the North American region. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Subtle Asian traits. I mean, I, I think, am I in the group? I think I joined the group. I never check it out. Uh, okay. Is there any, like, one more, one more description to it? Okay. Okay. Um, Smell. Originated from Taiwan. Taiwan. Oh, okay. Okay, there's so many names for it. There's bubble tea. There's boba tea. There is, uh, what's that? Tapioca tea. Tapioca ball uh, tea. Uh, <laughs> wow, you really oh, know yeah, the tea. Yeah, <laughs> boba, boba tea. Okay, okay, okay. Now, now it makes sense. Right. All right. So, what's the, what's okay. the what's the actual name? What what would you guys actually call it? Bubble tea, boba. I actually call it boba. boba. Yeah. I find I you know like, I find boba I is like... a very North American thing. Exactly. In North America, Nobody in Asia says boba. boba. Like when I hear, <laughs> like bubble tea. They, they go like, I don't, I don't drink milk tea or like bubble yeah. tea. Or they just call the name Chata Tiger Sugar. <laughs> I 
I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a North American thing, and, la, and it was crazy because like there's a sudden like hype in it, and like suddenly everyone's ranking these. these oh yeah, yeah, things. yeah! I remember that phase. And also, suddenly, like there's a there's a new like appearing of like so many of these new brands. Yeah, it's called Subang Jaya. As if as if the traffic there is really not bad enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, moving on, our next tea. Mm, okay, it's it's widely common during Chinese New Year, and then you usually get it in uh, packaging in box packaging. Chrysanthemum tea. Yes! Yes! My favorite. Oh my god, I love that so much. That's so good. The amount of sugar in there is That's amazing. Like, oh my god. Like, <laughs> Chinese New Year is essential. I know. Soya bean, uh, chrysanthemum, and then winter melon. And also the lychee. Oh, lychee, yeah, 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 that's right. All yeah. sugar, like, basically. Yeah. That, so that's it for our second episode of What's the Day? Unconventional Hustles. Thank you once again to our speaker, Yuen Yi. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Uh, Please do like and follow our podcast on Spotify and Anchor. And for those on YouTube, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and uh, comment down below for more exciting content. All right. Do leave us a comment and let us know what you think. Don't forget to join us next month for our next episode with Malaysian-born artist and activist, Red, also known as Hong Yi. Thank you for tuning in. Bye. Bye.